All right, welcome everybody, and uh, thank you for being uh, here for the uh, our first Friends of the Cabildo member lecture series. Um, we do these throughout the fall and the spring, and um, I think we have eleven already signed up uh, of eleven already for this year. Um, and you can find those at friendsofthecabildo.org. Um, we've got things such as uh, Lenore Tate. Um, Sue Strahan talking about Cafe Brulee, um, the, how Louisiana is going to be celebrating the 250th anniversary of, of the United States in 2026. So we've got a lot of different uh, lectures. As always, if you sign up you, and you can, can't make it live, you can get a recording uh, of it the next day. Uh, lectures are pretty much every Tuesday, uh, every on Tuesday nights, uh, two to three times a month. So I hope you take advantage of this. It's free for members. It's 10 if you're not. Um, but if you just attend a couple of them, you're already paid for your membership. I also want to re uh, remind our current members, and if you're not a member, to become a member, it's Museum Month. Um, there are over 20 museums that are part of Museum Month. So um, uh, NOMA, World War II Museum, uh, obviously the Louisiana State Museum um, are all members of, of Museum Month. So you can go to any of these museums if you show your friends of the Cabildo card. Um, so also, if you're not a member, you can always renew and then you can access these the rest of the month. Um, tonight's lecture, we're going to do, uh, we started off last year with uh, a four part series on um, kind of lost legends of Louisiana history. Uh, but this year, um, um, I was put in touch with uh, Jacob Gotro. And Jacob is a uh, just got his PhD from LSU. And now he's an adjunct professor at UL. And he's going to be talking about uh, the conservation um, movement in Louisiana and also, uh, you know, some of the leaders in conservation. Um, and so tonight he's going to be talking about E.A. McElhaney and his relationship to conservation. So I want to welcome Jacob Gotro. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I was just wondering if I could get a thumbs up if everybody could hear me real quick. Yeah, we can hear you great. OK, thank you so much. Okay, so um, as he said, I'm going to be talking about Edward Avery McElhaney, and I'll just go ahead and jump off from there. Um, so the early life and young adulthood of Edward Avery McElhaney uh, represents a unique perspective on competing visions of nature in Louisiana in the early 20th century. Um, the Southern form of the Gilded Age, referred to as the New South, lasted roughly from 1877 to 1900, or during which Louisiana was dominated by Bourbon Democrats, a term that was used to refer uh, to the Democratic coalition that ruled Louisiana during this time. Um, that coalition consisted of an alliance between a political machine ring, which dominated New Orleans politics, the surrounding coastal sugar planters, along with upcountry uh, cotton planters, rural merchants, and bankers. The progressive era lasting roughly from 1890 to 1920 in the national context and symbolized by the belief in an efficient yet rational approach to governance uh, is somewhat paradoxical in Louisiana. Although far from progressive in most forms of governance and social conditions, Louisiana did boast a record of natural plenitude from which calls for progressive conservation of the abundant resources enjoyed considerable support among the political electorate of the state in the early 20th century. However, that constituency was considerably smaller when we consider that Jim Crow legislation had disenfranchised many African Americans and qualifications restricted voting for many poor whites as well. Uh, therefore, a conservative vision of nature enshrined the rights of private property holders to govern natural resources located on their land as they saw fit, no matter the consequences. So an example of this type of reasoning would be giving preferential treatment to large corporations, uh, such as the Standard Oil Company, who underwrote the first oil severance tax in Louisiana in the Constitution of 1921, written under the progressive Democrat governor, uh, John M. Parker. So McElhaney's persona reveals that these visions of nature existed paradoxically at the same time within the same person. A conservationist attitude of best use also instilled a preservationist need to save wildlife. So his own life of privileged access to nature demonstrated the dismal prediction that existence was none other than a survival of the fittest. 
Uh, yet faith in technology and the unfathomable faith in progress that underwrote the progressive era instilled an unstoppable belief that society could and should change for the better. Ideas based on real world data uh, collected from hands-on experience underwrote good policies towards wildlife. Uh, McElhenney himself directly influenced the passage of the National Weeks McLean's Act of 1914, also referred to as the Migratory Waterfowl Treaty, and later the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 that has been in existence for over a century now. Yet such privileged experience came at a cost. The general populace of Louisiana and nationally, mostly low class, were demonized by such managerial actions and progress, progressive legislation um, as responsible for societal problems uh, due to their supposed inferior nature. Uh, such indictments towards low class, often minority populations undercut arguments by progressive conservationists that their conservative attitudes towards nature represented the best and most efficient approach to man managing natural resources um, truly in the interest of all. I say that as a question. Um, so the stark reminder that the 1927 flood provided uh, to the citizens of Louisiana was that wealth dominated political decision-making about natural resource and flood control in the state. The election of 1928 was the populist response uh, to conservative attitudes towards progress in nature. In this instance, liberal progress in nature would involve active entrepreneurial use of natural resources to generate improvement in social and economic condition for a wider swath of the population while also heavily benefiting those directly involved. The ultimate irony is that both the liberal approach to natural resource development, that in the name of progress, along with the conservative approach, which mandated a reserved and efficient natural resource consumption guided by corporate expertise, um, underwrote a larger and rapidly accelerating shift in global climate. What has now been entitled the Anthropocene or the proposed present era of human induced climate change uh, arguably stretches back to the late 1700s with the advent of the first industrial revolution. And by the late 1800s, Swedish scientists such as Savante August Arrhenius, pictured on the screen, uh, theorized that burning fossil fuels would lead to inevitable climate change and sudden climactic shifts. However, these fossil fuels underwrote both liberal and conservative visions of nature and underwrote progress at the dawn of a consumer society where individual needs are fulfilled at any cost. By the 19th century, sugar and cotton would emerge as the dominant crops from which planters extracted a profit from enslaved labor in Louisiana. Starting in the 1780s, the opportunity to acquire wealth through plantation agriculture along with other motivating factors created a wave of Anglo-American immigrants to the colony and then newly ordained state of Louisiana. The state was incorporated into the nation in 1812 despite protests from some Eastern colonists and sugar was taking hold. Sugar was transplanted to the state by Jesuit priests in the 1750s and perfected by Etienne Bore in the 1790s. And it turned an especially quick profit in the coastal parishes. However, the capital investment needed to start a sugar enterprise uh, required was enormous. Planters also needed large land grants in the tropical coastal and river parishes where freezes would not affect the sucrose level of the sugar cane. On one such land grant given to the Avery family of Virginia, a modest sugar enterprise was established on a salt dome protruding upwards in the otherwise flat coastal wetlands of South Central Louisiana. Avery Island, pictured on the screen, is not a traditional island, as in reality it is connected to the mainland and is roughly three miles north of open water in Vermilion Bay to its south. However, its name rings true in some sense as it is isolated in some essence um, and separated from the mainland by bayous, salt marsh, and cypress swamp. Uh, the quote-unquote island would serve as the setting for a naturalistic drama. The dense woods and marshy surrounding created the perfect opportunity to establish a wildlife preserve uh, cut off from degradation despite the surrounding agricultural development. Besides being the native home to many large mammalian species such as bear, whose presence attracted the presidential visit of Theodore Roosevelt in 1902, 
and a subspecies of deer, uh, the island most notably served as a gathering location for sizable masses of migratory waterfowl along with non-game bird life. Although the Avery family lost much of their sugar fortune during the Civil War, the invention and successful marketing of a delicious liquid capsicum solution, Tabasco, in 1868 by Edmund McElhenney, uh, a former New Orleans banker who had married Mary Eliza Avery, the daughter of the original family patriarch, Daniel Avery, uh, would, lead, would later lead to worldwide culinary recognition. Into this world of nature and market stepped a man that, although controversial in some respects, no doubt positively influenced the future of wildlife conservation, both in the state and the nation. Edward Avery McElhenney, better known as EA in historical reference, and Ned to friends and family, uh, left a lasting legacy on both the island, the company, and more widely recognized the flora and fauna of Louisiana. According to Shane Bernard, the Tabasco Company historian, Ned, born in March of 1872, got his early start as a student of nature through the lessons of the freedman, John Goffney. Goffney, a formerly enslaved African-American who continued to work for the family after, uh, was tasked with instructing EAs in the ways of nature. According to Scott E. Giltner, African Americans form a traditional or formed a traditional ecological knowledge base uh, that was based in hunting and fishing traditions in the Old South as a supplement to plantation supplied food. After emancipation following the Civil War, guns along with hunting and fishing activities symbolized a newfound freedom for African Americans. Market hunting and incessant extermination of wildlife led to a conservationist-based movement whose core support came from elite sportsmen. Nature, formulated here as wildlife, needed preservation. Eventually, this movement resulted in regulations which disenfranchised African Americans among other minority groups in the early 20th century. However, paradoxically, due to racist assumptions about supposed innate natural tendencies, elite sportsmen often relied on African-Americans as a source of traditional ecological knowledge about the natural world. Goffney provided EA an open air education, which along with access to formal personal tutors and familial connections developed an advocational interest in wildlife conservation and landscape preservation. He also honed his skills as a marksman through daily sporting ventures of hunting and fishing. The combination instilled as permanent parts of EA's personal identifiers, a conscious conservationist ethic of natural resource use, along with a naturalist taxonomical interest in identifying and collecting specimens. The first ideological construct to understand that was essential to EA's personality uh, was something of the naturalist collector. So this cultural figure emerged because of efforts during the 16th and 17th century scientific revolution. So scientists such as Francis Bacon attempted to identify uh, the taxonomical structures of the surrounding natural world. Um, essentially, they were trying to dissect its elements in compartmentalized study. Historians such as Caroline Mer Merchant have identified uh, this transformation with an epidemiological shift away from an organic or holistic worldview and towards a mechanistic rationality that justified domination of nature. However, others point to a far more ambiguous reality. Uh, writings by the naturalist Carl Linnaeus advocated um, that use of natural resources by humans was, well, was part of the larger organic cycle um, as the creator had intended. Within Louisiana, historian Daniel Usner has identified Antoine Simone Lepage de Prats, a traveler to the nascent colony of French Louisiana, who in the 18th century provided the first detailed descriptions of the natural flora, floral taxonomic structure of the region uh, later encompassing the state. Similar to EA, de Prats relied on an enslaved native woman to provide traditional ecological knowledge of herbs, which he then transmitted back to Europe through his writings and resulting illustrations. It's important to highlight though that neither Duprats nor McElhenney gave credit to their original source of natural knowledge. Scientific advancements in the 19th century also provided empirical evidence that the management of natural resources was necessary for America to thrive. 
a conservation ethic, so the second uh, kind of personal identifier key to understanding McElhinney. Uh, conservation ethics, along with natural resource abuse, can be seen as far as one wants to journey in written records or even into the prehistorical evidence. Uh, thinkers such as mid 19th century American politician George Perkins Marsh even theorized that the decline of the golden age of such empires as Greece or the collapse of the Roman Empire was connected directly to the mismanagement of natural resources. Marsh and others called for proper management of the relations between man and nature to prevent a repeat of such a downfall on the North American continent. Only through a properly balanced uh, relationship based on a conservation ethic of sustainable natural resource use would America be able to avoid the collapse of her recently extended empire. Degradation of any piece of the structure was detrimental to all involved. Yet competition underlay both the human and natural world. Charles Darwin's landmark 1859 publication on the origin of species posited a continual struggle of existence as the driving force of development in life. The famous quip that only the fittest survive was used as justification for a hierarchical view of the natural world with humans sitting on top. Others, however, such as Herbert Spencer, corrupted the dismal message of Darwin's theory uh, later in the century and used it to apply it to humans as justification of industrial exploitation and racist mistreatment of minorities along with colonial subjects at the hands of Western powers as Amer America turned its eyes uh, elsewhere and outward uh, by the 1890s. Unfortunately, Darwin's depressing prediction seemed close to fruition by the turn of the 19th, I mean, by the turn of the 20th century. North American resources were exploited and degraded to the point of collapse in the name of regional and international competition. In the case of wildlife, the near extinction of the pristine buffalo, an ever present symbol of the Western frontier, or really the bison, uh, or eradication of the passenger pigeon, uh, signaled the level of abuse that development wrought on the flora and fauna of the North American landscape. Partially in response to the disappearance, but also in some instance as a response to a loss of status due to industrialization, elite across America aim to preserve the pers their perspective of the proper, proper management of the natural world. Ironically, some of the conservation movement's strongest proponents were manly sportsmen bent on saving game to kill. Only through their enlightened, inspired philosophy of conservative, conscious management by fit, civilized, white Anglo-Saxon men would resources last for future posterity, use, and enjoyment? Such pronouncements of expertise were the calling cards, the political calling cards of the progressive conservationist movement of the early 20th century. And politicians and sportsmen such as Theodore Roosevelt and Iowa Senator John Lacey used examples of natural resource abuse and the need for conservation as partial advocation of their fitness for political management of the natural world. And this took place during Teddy's term as vice president and president from 1899 to 1908, but stretched far beyond. Notwithstanding the national upsurge in conservationist masculine identification, along with familial connections to Roosevelt, EA was a devoted adherent to both ideologies due to firsthand experience. He saw declines in wildlife at a point blank range. Over the course of his lifetime, the animal population in Southern Louisiana, including the pristinely colored snowy egret, declined precipitously due to the impacts of plume hunting and agricultural development. Attending military school in New York and Illinois, and then Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, gave EA some formal education in the basics of the natural sciences. Yet firsthand experience motivated his initial actions in nature. At home during a break from schooling around 1892, a visiting British diplomat reportedly told a story of an Indian prince who had built a nest to permanently host the lovely tropical birds that migrated to his native region of the subcontinent. The birds broke free from the nest. However, they returned the following year and used it for their brooding rituals. Inspired by the story, 
EA, along with Goffney, built a similar structure in a dammed and flooded pond on Avery Island that served as a setting from which EA enacted his personal conservationist mission. He captured eight adult egrets from the dwindling population and raised them in a newly built setting. And at the end of the nesting season, he released them, and within a few days, they migrated north. However, the birds returned the following year, providing proof of the validity behind the princely parable. Returning to school for a short period, EA once again decided to participate in a more tactile appreciation of the natural world. In the summer of 1894, he signed up for a mission to explore the Canadian Arctic coast under the direction of explorer Frederick Cook. EA was enlisted as an ornithologist and expert of bird life, as well as a skilled scientist and marksman. He used his time in the Arctic to collect artifacts of naturally historical importance, namely those related to Inuits or natives to the Arctic region, or to harvest wild resources for both his contingent or personal collection. Here in the unknown, he observed bird life that was familiar to him. Migratory waterfowl, such as ducks and geese, journeyed or that journeyed to Avery Island in the winter, traveled north in the summer. During the 1890s, EA participated in an increasingly common search among the wilderness obsessed elite naturalists to explore and catalog what they envisioned in terminology, terminology such as unknown, primitive, or primordial. Such natural scientists and artifact hunters created an artificial bifurcation between supposed civilized or modern societies and their traditional antecedents. While such conceptual noodling justified imperialism and exploitation abroad, it also created funding for searches within the North American continent itself. In 1897, EA received university funding as well as contributing his own personal resources in order to finance a scientific expedition to observe and collect the local flora and fauna of Point Barrow, Alaska, which included the indigenous population. Once there, he turned into an impromptu rescuer when two passing ships were trapped in freezing ice north of the Arctic settlement. EA fulfilled his role of the marksman, provisioner, and manager during the trying time, and the group weathered the cold Arctic winter of 1897 to 1898. Journal entries reveal a strain between the famished sailors and the orderly EA. The sailors complained, grumbled, or simply refused commands to gather food, food or replenish, replenish dwindling wood supplies. EA worried that supplies would run low before the ice broke in the spring. Yet despite these tense preoccupations, EA reenacted his role as a naturalist collector. He gathered local plant and animal specimens, undoubtedly garnering lessons about the supposedly unknown Arctic world from the local Inuit population. In 1898, EA, EA's brother and company head, I'm sorry. In 1898, EA's brother and company head, John McElhenney would leave to join Roosevelt's Rough Riders, a cavalry unit partially made up of some of the elite sons of the American upper class, but also of hardened frontiersmen and even Native Americans who fulfilled the role of nature guide and frontier credentials. After serving in the Spanish-American War, John would go on to serve a life of civil service and form a personal friendship with Teddy Roosevelt, uh, partially through his companionship on many of Teddy's famed bear hunting expeditions including those in Louisiana. The national narrative usually follows that Roosevelt, in search of bagging big game across the continent, journeyed to the southeast to hunt the subspecies of brown bear native to the region in the fashion of the quote-unquote old planters. This tradition of hunting entailed trailing the bear with dogs endlessly through the thick stands of cane that followed the water bottoms in the lower Mississippi River Valley. In 1902, Roosevelt was guided by none other than Holt Collie, an African-American guide whose prowess in nature was valued by the wealthiest sportsmen in the South. After days of no success for the presidential hunting party, Collier finally cornered a sickly bear. Tied to a tree, the bear was a pitiful sight for the president's eyes, and he refused to partake in the slaughter 
of such a wretched animal. A political cartoon reflecting the incident famously spawned the soft and cuddly teddy bear children's toy. However, another, another even lesser known bear hunting destination for Roosevelt that year was the dense swamps surrounding Avery Island in South Louisiana. Reportedly, reportedly visiting the island in 1902, Roosevelt partook in another unsuccessful bear hunt. However, Roosevelt returned to the Louisiana cane breaks in 1907. Under the direction of famed North Louisiana wild man and big game fanatic, Ben Lilly, Roosevelt hunted the region of Northeastern Louisiana, now recognized as the Tinsaw National Wildlife Refuge, and early referenced in literature as a sportsman's paradise due to the abundance of native wildlife. Here, Roosevelt fulfilled his manly desire of successfully bagging the subspecies of brown bear. Becoming head of the Tabasco Sauce Company in the early 1900s, and thus in some sense master of his domain, EA would continue to develop manage and advocate for wildlife, including highlighting those he felt responsible for its decline. By the early 1900s, the migratory bird population on the preserve of Avery Island would skyrocket. Thousands of birds flocked to the island on a yearly basis, increasing from the eight specimen that EA originally raised in the pen to 10,000 by, by 1910. This migration occurred as many species of bird life were threatened due to market and human pressures. The recognition that waterfowl follow roughly the same geographic route every year entitled a flyway would only emerge in the 1910s and 20s. Bird banding or attaching metal bands to birds and noting their geographic distribution when tagged and later collected provided empirical ed evidence to satisfy the newly ordained pragmatic order. The timeline for when Ned began banding birds is debatable. In letters written well later, he claimed to have started in the 1890s, uh, well before other uh, bird banders were really starting in the national kind of context. What is certain, however, is that EA embraced the method by which to prove such flyways existed by 1912. In 1913, EA employed the new technology of film to construct a narrative of slaughter and responsibility uh, to achieve reformation among a cinematic audience. EA hired the French film company Path Frères to construct a narrative centered on the horrors of plume hunting for the millinery trade. Hard scenes of adult birds whose flesh was ripped from their quivering skin while the young cried out to their dying mothers shocked audiences. The heart-wrenching narrative moved spectators across the nation. At first reaching the expected elite rosters of wildlife and sportsmen's clubs, the narrative also proved adaptable to, pres to preservationist societies, local theaters, and country fairs where the film reached various onlookers and social classes. Responsibility was placed ultimately on the consumers of the final product from the slaughter, women purchasers and wearers of feather ordained hats. Such moving exploits occurred in a similar time frame as the larger emphasis on a national wildlife conservation uh, really reached a zenith, symbolized by the Roosevelt inspired yearly governor's conference on conservation. Starting in 1908, the last year of Roosevelt's presidency, but continuing well beyond, the conferences responded to a popular outcry to regulate natural resources, which resulted in newly created state departments of conservation and eventually resulted in federal legislation of migratory waterfowl in the form of the previously mentioned 1916 Migratory Waterfowl Treaty and related 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. EA played a key role in amplifying the outcry as his film was exhibited throughout the country. Resistance to such federal regulation included arguments for home rule over control of assets in nature, or the right of state governments to govern natural resources within the confines of their jurisdictional boundaries. However, migratory waterfowl presented a problem at both the state and federal levels as birds know no such boundaries as state or national borders, hence the need for federal and even international legislation. 
Within Louisiana, the new State Department of Conservation attempted to take on a role as not only a manager of wildlife, but also mineral and forest resources. After Luther Hall, the progressive Democrat governor of Louisiana elected in 1912, attended at least one of the national conservation conferences. The DOC was led by a commission of three members appointed by the current governor. Stanley Clisby Author was anointed as one of the first conservation commissioners by Hall in 1912. Arthur was no expert on wildlife, rather according to McElhenney's later assessment, he was a newspaper man who had made his name as a writer for the New Orleans Times Picayune. Despite McElhenney's judgment, Arthur still commanded what little power the state agency had. And in a revealing set of communications to McElhenney, Arthur revealed that the target of wildlife legislation was often the market hunters, highlighted in the popular press and in McElhenney's film. Despite the national focus on conservation, market hunters still operated relatively freely in the dense swamps and endless marshes of Southern Louisiana and often imported their catch uh, to such urban confines as New Orleans. Enforcement of new wildlife regulations often took on racial characteristic, characteristics that expanded beyond the spectrum of black and white, uh, especially in the multi-ethnic mix of coastal Louisiana. In a communication to McElhenney in 1915, Commissioner Author referred to traveling to the Southeast Louisiana town of Donaldsonville, quote, 15 miles above where some Italians and Negroes were reported shooting cranes. He wanted to catch them in the act and see if I can't have the limit given to them. However, Author's efforts did not come solely from a fantastical place of misguided racial assumptions. McElhenney himself reported communicating with Representative E.L. Rhodes, who had traveled to an egret colony in Cameron Parish, southwest Louisiana, in July 1916. Here he noted abundant bird life and, upon insistence from McElhenney, returned with the intentions to protect the colony. However, upon return just a few days later, the entire egret herony was demolished. Baying chicks lay among the carcasses of deceased and defeathered de mother birds. Market plume hunters ruthlessly slaughtered the colony in order to quench the unquenchable thirst of feathered product consumers. Despite misrepresentations of women consumers as the sole motive driving the slaughter, McElhenney's cinematic debut did point out the very real horrors of plume hunting. McElhenney's and Arthur's efforts fit in line with the spirit of reformation in cinema, cinema prevalent during the presidential term of progressive Democrat Woodrow Wilson. Early film, most simply defined here as a series of repeating images, appealed to mostly middle and low class, often immigrant audiences. And many of the earliest films reflected the busy everyday life of urban People, early na narratives uh, followed fantastical escapist science, science fiction tales, which allowed urban working viewers a means of relief from reality through a cinematic mental escape. However, by the 19 teens, elite reformers had jumped upon the technology's bandwagon as a means of rejuvenation related to their individual reformist agenda. Uh, most infamously depicted in the racist retelling of Reconstruction in D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, reformers were set on fixing the ills they saw in society by using new implements of technology to disseminate their agenda. So in Griffith's case, this was a reposition of a racial order in the form of the Wilsonian White House, who had held a private viewing of the film in 1915, with the ultimate goal of cinematic reformation the imposition of a moral order uh, guided by the reformers' contextual interests. Bird life, particularly herons, egrets, and cranes, was McElhenney's self-appointed area of expertise as represented by his early reformist film, The Destruction of the Snowy Egret, as it was titled. However, he was not the only ornithologist uh, studier of birds to employ films as a method of redemption. Herbert K. Job, an applied economic ornithologist for the National Audubon Society in 1916, uh, ventured into the surreal realm with his, with his narrative entitled The Spirit of Audubon, which envisioned a moral tale with cleansing possibilities. 
Audubon Society is named for the naturalist and great artist of bird life, John James Audubon, emerged in the 1880s. And despite a rocky start, uh, by the second decade of the 20th century, they had formed chapters in nearly every state of the nation. In the story told in the, the spirit of Audubon, the film, the lives of two similarly, similarly aged but oppositely reared children reflect the stark method, message that an upbringing with exposure to correct behavior towards wildlife was a necessary implement of good citizenship. One child is taught by her mother to revere bird life, while the other is given no such lesson of restraint. After the uninstructed boy robs a nest, the learned child scolds the thief. Later in that night, both children are visited by the ghostly apparition of Audubon, who is angry with the boy's behavior. They take a surreal journey to foreign lands in order to observe bird life in all its multicolored worldly splendor. Purportedly reformed by the dream, the quote, nest robber awoke the next morning to find the sleepy nightmare a distant vision, yet its impact was felt. He joined his father in attending the yearly Audubon parade held in celebration of bird life. Ending at the grave of the famed naturalist, both children are cemented as lovers of birds. Despite national and local conservation efforts that, efforts that demonize lower class individuals, often ethnic minorities, Ned seemed to have a soft spot for the local Cajun population. During the early efforts to establish state and federal regulations on hunting migratory waterfowl in the 19 teens, Ned petitioned the Bureau of Biological Survey to make an exception for spring duck hunting in Louisiana due to the Linton tradition of the local population, a majority of Catholic religious heritage. However, his sympathy did not extend to the well-established tradition of shooting grossback, French for big beak and a local reference to the black crown knight heron. The bird, a native to Mexico, traveled to the Tupelo and Cypress swamps, common to southern Louisiana every spring. Local Cajuns incorporated the feathered migrant into their local diet and often used the indigenous hunting technique of knocking the birds out of low-hanging branches with dirt balls. In 1925, dirt-grubbing locals knocked birds out of trees on the local burial landform Marsh Island. The archival record also bears proof of violence inherent in attempting to impose new governmental regulations over prospective wildlife resources. One of McElhenney's own recommended state game wardens, Remick Saunier, was shot in the face while attempting to perform his duties uh, near the area of Marsh Island. McElhenney's relation to Native Americans extended beyond the Arctic world as well. The search for a mythical origin of American identity drove the study of archaic Indian mounds in the 19th century and even led to a narrative of a lost mound builder civilization. However, by the 1890s, the recognition of native mound construction by archaeologists working for the Smithsonian prefigured a larger effort among the upper class to, upper class to preserve the supposedly disappearing culture of primitive native peoples of North America. By the 1920s, a search was on for the as of yet undiscovered mounds of native people in Louisiana. And like many professionals, EA referred to local repositories of ecological knowledge and acquired the location of such mounds from trappers whom he had a commercial relationship with to supply Smithsonian scientists who are, were on the lookout for these unidentified mounds. McElhenney's relative, Sarah Avery McElhenney, was also notably involved with efforts to preserve Native American land for the Chittimacha tribe in South Central Louisiana. The Chittimacha were one of the few remaining tribes in the Southeastern United States having survived the 1831 Indian Removal Act. And the Indian tribe was granted property titles to just over 1,000 acres in the 1800s. But by the turn of the 20th century, only about 260 acres remained in tribal hands. Thanks to tribal leaders and help provided by economically fortunate families, such as the McElhenney's, the tribe was formally recognized in 1924. The recognition proved of utmost importance for Chittimacha tribal members as their population revived simultaneously to the coastal zone's mineral production potential being realized in the early to mid 20th century. 
As a student of conservation and an early advocate of scientific wildlife protection, McElhinney connected his earlier recognition of bird migration and flyways to the need for protected refuges for feeding, which earned him one of the monikers, or one of his many monikers, father of the refuge system in Louisiana. After a chance encounter in a sporting goods store in New Orleans in 1910, McElhenney enlisted the help of Charles Willis Ward, an Ohio businessman, to gather funds to purchase a sizable tract of land occupying the Louisiana coast. McElhenney would spend the next few decades improving access to this and other surrounding properties by digging canals to the newly purchased, purchased lands. Further lobbying led to the purchase of Marsh Island by the widow of robber baron and philanthropist Russell Sage, Margaret Olivia Slocum Sage, along with the acquisition of a larger tract of land further to the west, purchased by the Rockefeller Foundation in 1914. The end goal was to establish an entire band of refuges along the coast that would serve as a protected winter home for the great flocks of migratory wildlife. Within preservationist societal circles that contradicted with McElhinney's conservationist vision of nature management, controversy soon arose. And so you can see the three um, refuges that McElhinney was directly responsible or at least involved with establishing on Louisiana's coast, so South Central and Southwest Louisiana. So to, to the controversy. In the 1920s, McElhenney's supposed connected efforts to establish a club uh, called the Gulf Coast Club at the terminal of the migratory waterfowl um, kind of pathway uh, caused a stir among preservationists. Termed a slaughtering ground by William T. Hornady, a preservationist or ultra conservationist as historian Jason Terrio has labeled them, McElhenney was much criticized for attempting to establish this club in between the series of protected refuges. Once the proposed public shooting grounds of the club was nixed, the public fervor died down, but the instant somewhat silly, sullied EA's reputation as a conservationist in the national context. However, it should also be noted that EA touted the possibilities of industrial development, noted today as a major contributor to anthropogenic climate change and coastal degradation as a potential lure for possible investors in the Louisiana Gulf Coast Club. McElhinney referenced traditional ecological knowledgeable users again to answer the queries of potential investors attempting to find local repositories of gas blows and oil seeps. In enticing descriptions of the club to potential members, he warned that Louisiana's wetlands were depicted as, quote, the last frontier in the Southeast in terms of agricultural development. The great flocks of migratory waterfowl made the area a sportsman's paradise that stood as, a, as America's last great hunting ground. Here, the cultural symbol of a sportsman's paradise enticed Northern and Midwestern investors to concentrate funds on the Gulf Coast as both a smart business decision and as a fulfillment of manly leisure sporting activities. The audience must place EA within the context of his surroundings. Many progressive doctrines such as conservation did have positive effects on the preservation of the flora and fauna of North America. So EA deserves credit for his title, the father of conservation in Louisiana and the father of the state refuge system. The important conceptual data that a lifetime of managing one's own paradise where man and the environment exist in a supposed balance is undeniable. In this vein, EA and his natural history collection stored at Louisiana State University are evidence of the emerging ecological efforts among conservationists to preserve a rapidly disappearing natural world in the face of a modern industrial onslaught. Yet those efforts simultaneously castigated lower class, often ethnic minorities, as responsible for the slaughter while justifying investment and exploitation of natural resources that inaugurated the Anthropocene. And so just in my last slide, I have uh, citations to any of the photos that were used during the presentation. Um, and so you can ask me if you're curious about any of the source locations. And so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. 
Yeah, and if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat um, or um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, I did want to open up the questions, Jacob, about um, you mentioned the, um, and it, it was kind of a little bit of side note, but that, you know, he did have some um, affinity for w working with African Americans because uh, a lot of them were scouts and everything like that. Did he ever go to, that reminded me of, of, of scouts in Africa. Did he ever basically go to Africa and ever work in the same way? I mean, it seems like a guy that was such a big conservationist and, and was obviously a big Teddy Roosevelt fan. Africa would be something in that, in that vein. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, I didn't, I didn't see any evidence in the collections at LSU that he went to Africa besides an advertisement that was uh, kind of enticing him, offering him uh, to go on a safari in Africa. And it's it's kind of a uh, similarly timed to Roosevelt's trip or maybe a decade after Roosevelt's trip, but I didn't see any evidence that he he did journey to Africa, but I don't wanna say for sure that he did um, because I don't know that as 100% certainty. Uh, another name that uh, th I thought of when I was hearing the Teddy Roosevelt was also uh, Ernest Hemingway. Did he ever have any, in his, uh, all of his, stuff that he left LSU. Was there any talk of Ernest Hemingway? Because obviously he was very big influential during that time period as well. Again, yeah, that's a great question. Um, similar mind thinking, but again, I didn't see any evidence um, mm -hmm. that he meant Ernest Hemingway, read Ernest Hemingway, or was, was in any way uh, associated with it. But that, again, that doesn't mean it's a certainty. He, maybe he was a fan and I just didn't see any evidence of it. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. The um, how has the um, the the company or the family uh, responded to um, coastal western uh, coastal coastal restoration losses um, that we've had around with you know basically their livelihood? Have they been at the forefront of this, or have they been working um, to also preserve their area, which is you know they're basically their the livelihood of the uh, of a lot of people who work down there. Uh, to my knowledge, they are working to preserve it. In fact, when I was working at the, uh, the Avery Island Archives, this was uh, quite a number of years ago, and a sinkhole had actually opened up. And in the the weeks that I was there, I saw them repeatedly bringing, uh, you know, gravel or dirt or whatever they were dumping into the hole. So they're they're obviously working on uh, preserving what they can, and and I'm sure that they're they're very interested in in preserving the island as it is or in the closest you know kind of setting that they can they can but I, I really don't know the details as far as how involved the family is in the current current time period well we've got a couple more weeks with you we've got um um we've got next week on regular tuesday and then because of uh, your uh, uh new work schedule uh the weeks three and four are going to be on monday nights at 6 p.m nothing to do if you've already signed up you'll get the emails and everything like that uh, and the recordings, but it's, so if you can't make a, mo uh, uh, a Monday, that's okay. We'll get it to you the next day. Um, but next week we'll be do Caroline Dorman's efforts as a conservationist and cultural preservationist. Um, anything you might want to say about uh, Caroline and just kind of a little bit of a teaser on what you're going to talk about her? Oh, I, I'm going to talk about uh, Caroline's records that are at Northwestern uh, uh, State University. Um, but also I'm going to talk about actually touring Briarwood and getting to see, um, you know, kind of the efforts of Dorman and uh, what it has become today, which is the preserve of Briarwood, which is also where Louisiana Tech uh, hosts their native propagation kind of a uh, center or one of their centers for native propagation. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit uh, more how it comes through in present day. Oh, fantastic. Oh, uh, well, uh, I find this uh, this subject is going to be, uh, we're going to learn a lot. Uh, Tamara says, fascinating. Look forward to the next presentation. So we look forward to the next three weeks. Jacob, well, we appreciate uh, you doing uh, this tonight and we'll see you over the next three weeks and we'll see everybody else uh, next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Thank, thank you question. for having me. Oh, wait, go ahead. You got one question. Yeah, thank you so much, Jacob. Um, I grew up in New Iberia, so I'm, I'm lots of my family members worked on Avery Island. I had a question that goes back to a comparison between E.A. McElhenney and another conservationist of the early 20th century, Aldo Leopold, mm -hmm. who was, you know, his his land ethic was so different from what you've presented in terms of E.A. McElhenney, who was more exploit exploitative. 
So can you reflect at all on the differences in these worldviews of these two men? I would say, I would say, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're uh, completely different. Uh, I do have in mind that uh, um, EA was trying his best in his own way um, to preserve the world that he saw around him that was disappearing around him. So I, I don't think that he was completely opposed to such a land ethic. I think he would have um, agreed with Leopold in certain respects. Um, but I, I do think um, that that he did he did kind of highlight the the exploited you know the things that we could exploit in nature for profit and and why why that creates such a difference. I, I mean, uh, I think it's really a, maybe a personal um, way that you you personally view nature or view natural resources and, and their use and how your relationship uh, towards natural resources to be. Because at the end of the day, I think EA was a, was a businessman. And, and so right. he viewed natural resources as a business opportunity, which is not, um, from my understanding, the way Leopold would have looked at things. All right, All right. Thank you. That's, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll see everybody next week. And uh, Jacob, thank you so much. And we look forward to the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye.